Well, let's get right to it. I'm going to ask a few questions, and then I'm going to invite questions from the audience. But uh, you have had a, had a remarkable journey from civil rights attorney to candidate for vice president of the United States. Tell us what drew you to public service. Um, I, think, I think probably it's a faith background. My, uh, my parents are great Irish Catholics from Kansas City. And uh, I grew up at a time where, with the aid of both good public education and Jesuit high school education, I really became you know, passionate about public service. Uh, the traditional gospel lessons of trying to watch out for those who didn't have anybody else to watch out for them. And I also grew up at a time of turmoil. I was 10 years old when Martin Luther King and RFK were assassinated. I was five years old and came home from kindergarten to see my mother crying in front of the TV the day that JFK was assassinated. And so as a kid, when you're kind of forming your views of the world, the Vietnam War, the civil rights movement, even in my sort of sheltered Irish Catholic suburb in Kansas City, it made a huge impression on me. I, um, I certainly didn't think that I would be doing public service in elected office because I decided after I had spent a year working as a missionary in Honduras that I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer in the South. And that's what I did for about 17 years, fighting discrimination, mostly in housing, for people either who were turned away because of their race or disability. But then one day, this is just what happens, and I hope it might happen to some of you, I just got mad at my city council. Um, and you know, you, you see people doing a job that you would think I could never do that. I could never be in politics. That's not me. But you see them do something, and you think, well, I, I think I could do better than that. And that was 22 years ago. And um, it's been a remarkable ride with a lot of twists and turns and surprises along the way. So as you said, you you left Harvard Law School for a year to work as a Catholic missionary in Honduras. What led you to do that, and what impact did that have? Um, I went through Mizzou in three years and went right to Harvard Law School. I was probably the youngest person in my class when I started. And I was surrounded by a lot of people who had taken time off. I've already visited with some students today who had taken gap years before they started here at Tufts. And I will say, I'm so glad to be here because you guys have such a tradition of public service and encouraging civic engagement, the Tisch School and the university generally. And when I got to Harvard and I realized, OK, I'm 21 years old. Everyone around me seems so sure about what they want to do with their life, and I'm not really sure. Now, I learned later they were just good actors. They didn't really know anything. <laughs> but, but they did kind of impress it on me, why rush? And so about three months into my first semester at Harvard, I went to the dean and said, you know, I think I want to take a year off and go work with Jesuit missionaries. This was a contact with a high school I'd gone to in Kansas City. And the dean at the time, it was pretty unusual to take a year off. So the first thing she did was, check to see if my tuition was paid. Well, I'm not sure it's okay. You're not having financial trouble. Well, then they checked my grades. Okay, well, you're not on Mars but You're not flunking out either. Um, so they were puzzled about taking a year off, but I, I just kind of had a still small voice in me that said I should try to go do something for others, not just to do something for others, but also to learn what I wanted to do. I, I went kind of blithely into a very tough situation. Um, Honduras at the time, military dictatorship. The people I worked with were persona non grata with the military. A couple of them arrested when I was there. A couple of Jesuits that I met in Central America were killed. One by the Honduran military a few years after I left, and a couple in a shooting by death squads of Jesuits in El Salvador in 1989. So it was a very, very challenging environment that challenged so many preconceptions I had about life and taught me how sheltered I was in, in my experiences. But that then made me return the next year to law school very focused on using my limited gifts to try to help others. And um, it really was the foundation of, the, of what has now turned into this kind of public service career. Well, you, you have made very good use of your limited gifts. Um. <laughs> I'm a humble guy with a lot to be humble about. That was, one, that was one of the best introductions anybody ever gave me. Tim Kaine, a humble person with a lot to be humble about. So, <laughs> so tell us. What was it like to run for Vice President of the United States, and how have you dealt personally with the disappointment that you must feel with the results? It's, uh, it, it was, I mean, it was a wild and surreal ride, and all but the last two hours was really great. I mean, I will say, <laughs> um, it was, uh, <laughs> my, my parents are still alive. They're completely non-political. You know, the, the, the opportunity to bring both my parents and my wife's parents to the convention, to have them travel with me on the trail, 
it was really remarkable. I didn't know Hillary Clinton that well until about two weeks before she asked me to be a running mate, and we got to be very, very close. And I, I see a side of her that I just wish, I just wish everybody could see, because I, you know, some people, the, what you see in 3D is so different than what you see in 2D, and that was a real, you know, wonderful experience for me. There had never been a ticket before where somebody was fluent in Spanish and could go into you know, Spanish language TV, radio, newspapers, neighborhoods and do speeches completely in Spanish. That was a first for the campaign and I did a heavy amount of campaigning that way. I, I play music and once people realized that they insisted upon having a band at everything I did and they demanded that I sing for my supper and you know, play with bluegrass or, or Texas swing bands or whatever and that was, that was fun. And the opportunity to you know, get out of, I, I know one state's politics very well, but I, even having been a chairman of the Democratic Party, and that's how Alan and I met, I didn't know the, the, you know, the vastness and the diversity of different states' political traditions. And I went to, in 105 days, I went to 140 cities and 40 states. And so that was amazing. But yeah, very disappointing. I mean, not, not only because you want to win, I, I was 8-0 in elections before this one. And I used to say, I used to say I'm undefeated in elections and now I have to say I've never lost the popular vote in any elections. <laughs> um, so. and, and, you know, the, the personal disappointment, I'm, I, I thank goodness have a short attention span. So, you know, I, I, I dealt with some personal disappointment and got over the personal side of it. But, you know, I, I, I work for the country. Um, I think our country is strong. I think we have checks and balances. I think we are a resilient people, and so we will figure it out. But I, I have some concerns, and so that's part of the disappointment, too. But I'll tell you what has been enormously helpful for me in dealing with disappointment. There are a couple of things. Um, I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I think things happen for a reason, and you may not be able to figure out the reason immediately. Sometimes I can look back at my life and figure things out that I couldn't understand at the time. So I'm supposed to be in the Senate. I'm supposed to do a good job in the Senate. I'm lucky to be in the Senate. I like my work in the Senate. I can figure out that piece of it even if I can't figure out other pieces of it. So my faith life has helped me get it. Um, I have a philosophy about failure because uh, everybody in life fails at things. And you get older, I'm 58, you have accumulated things that you've failed at. And my philosophy about failure has been since I've been an adult, when I fail at something, this is my job, to demonstrate to my children, who are now 27, 24, 21, that you can fail, and that's just naturally part of life, and you can deal with it. So when I failed at things, lost cases, had clients on death row executed, and been there with them when it happened, and when I've been at my lowest moment, I've always telling myself, I should try to behave in such a way that my children will understand that failing at things is, is just a, a part of life. And, and now I'm not only surrounded by children, but I had all these young campaign staffers around me, and I needed to model that behavior for them. But probably the thing that's been best about dealing with the disappointment is just getting back to work. I was back in the Senate one week after Election Day, and I introduced a bill that day with Marco Rubio. We're on the Foreign Relations Committee together, and we're both worried about the rise of anti-Semitism around the world, and we, were, we introduced a bill dealing with giving the State Department some tools to to you know, challenge that. And just getting right back to work, working on the defense authorizing bill, I'm on armed services, getting put on the help committee where I am in the thick of the battle to save health insurance for 30 million people. That, if that doesn't get you up in the, you know. If, 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 if that can't get you up in the morning with a sense of excitement, you know, okay, you should consider another line of work. So I, I think, you know, throw yourself into something you're passionate about, and, I'm, and I do feel very blessed with the opportunity I have right before me. That's how I've kind of dealt with it. So I mentioned the question that we're, people are asking themselves, how would you answer the question, what should we do? And what do you say to college students specifically and young people who don't see politics as a way to solve our nation's problems and maybe mm -hmm. feel even more so after this election? Yeah, I, I, I can relate to that sentiment. I've got my, my three kids. I have one Marine infantry commander deeply interested in politics, as you might imagine. I mean, it affects everything about what he does. And I have two artists, um, neither of whom are particularly interested in politics. But they're very altruistic people who are really interested in particular issues. 
They just don't think politics is the way to go at it. Um, I have a feeling that the next few years are going to produce some events that are going to take altruistic people who, are, who care deeply about climate change and are going to make them realize, wow, political engagement is part of what we ought to do if we care about climate change. People who care about LGBT equality, political engagement is part of what we do if we care about LGBT equality. So the, the what to do answer that I've been giving, and I'll, actually I'll flip it from the way I normally do it, a non-political piece and a political piece. Non-political, think about you know, the issue that most energizes you in the world. Is it climate? Is it equality? Is it uh, immigrants' rights? Is it education reform? Think about the issue that you most care about. Maybe the issue you're most afraid about. And then find the grassroots organization that works on that issue. We're, we're already seeing tremendous uptick. I mean, look at these marches over the weekend. Just an amazing uh, outpouring of engagement and involvement all over the country and all over the world. If, 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 and, you know, I had family members. My, my 82-year-old mother was marching in Santa Fe. My sister-in-law nieces in Kansas City, cousins in Helena, Montana, and D.C. My daughter in New York, all over the country and all over the world. Find that grassroots thing that you either care most about or most worried about and get engaged. And groups like Planned Parenthood and others are seeing a dramatic uptick in engagement for just that reason. And then second, on the politics side, I think be local. I, I, if I'm good at anything in politics, it's because I started as a city council person where it was really tangible and really about accessibility and really about results. And even though we all knew who the Dems and ours were, it didn't really make any difference because you got to produce a tangible result in local government. So I'd, I'd pitch local involvement, but I'd also say governor's races and senator's races. Um, gerrymandering is a real problem, deep problem in the country, and the governors that start to get elected next year, Virginia and New Jersey, and then Massachusetts and many states in 18, 19, 20, the next four years of governors are the governors who have veto pins over redistricting plans. We can dramatically make our politics better if we work on redistricting reform. Governors are important. And then it'll sound self-serving since I'm up for re-election in 2018, but um, <laughs> the Senate is really important too because um, the Senate has, the minority in the Senate, whether Democrat or Republican, has some tools. The, the, the Senate minority can be an emergency break. Sadly, the House minority, things are done by straight majority vote, and often the House minority doesn't have tools. Um, after redistricting, you might have a narrower House, and then we could talk differently about it. But the Senate, a minority of 48 right now, we have tools. We have tools to slow things down. We have tools to shine a spotlight, to investigate, sometimes to stop bad things from happening. The Senate has control um, over the advice and consent around presidential nominations, cabinet members, Supreme Court others. We may not be able to stop cabinet nominees. I've had two interactions with cabinet nominees where I was very focused you know, on, on, on some areas of, on, and on, on some areas of disagreement. There are members of the cabinet I'm definitely voting for. There are some that I'm concerned about. Even if I can't defeat the ones I'm concerned about, I can put on the table in the light of day some really important issues. And by putting it on the table in the light of day, you can sometimes put up a guardrail against some abuses, against some things happen while nobody's paying attention. And so I, I, I think the, keeping the Senate at near parity or maybe even getting a, you know, a majority so that there is one Democratic lever in the, in the three-way relationship between Congress and the President in 2018 is a really worthwhile way to spend time. But start on the grass, grassroots side, and I have a feeling that will merge you into an, a realization that on that issue you're most passionate about, being engaged in electoral politics is really important. Having said that, our country is deeply divided right now. And what do you think that people in the Congress, people in the Democratic Party specifically, can do to bridge the divide and bring Americans together? First, we, those of us who are in the position, we've got to walk a very difficult tightrope of being passionate about principle without being mean-spirited or jerks <laughs> in, the, in the rhetoric that we use about anybody, including our colleagues. You know, one of the worst parts of the campaign, and, and President Monaco, I heard your introduction, I mean, it was, a, it was a campaign that led a lot of people to question whether there were norms anymore uh, about how we talk about people. And it's very important for those of us who do this to try to and I try to do this, I'm not perfect at it, but I try really hard to, to challenge policies that are bad without 
saying if you're different than me, you're either stupid or, or ill-motivated. I mean, that, everything kind of devolves to an ad hominem attack where we almost don't allow for a reasonably intellectual uh, difference of opinion these days, and if somebody's different than us, we name call them. Abraham Lincoln, the best speech that has ever been given that I've read, so it would be English language speech, was Lincoln's second inaugural, which is a beautiful speech given in March of 1865. Now, if, if ever anybody was entitled to, be a, to give a triumphal speech, it was Abraham Lincoln in March of 1865. They were within weeks of, of winning the Civil War, but it was a, not a triumphal speech at all. It was a very reflective and spiritual speech. He made two points that are really important. He said, first, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see what is right. So you gotta be firm in the right. You have to recognize that you're not right because you're a genius. If you're right, it's just because you know, you've been given the gift to see what's right. So there's a little humility there, but be firm in your positions. That's a good thing. Be firm in your positions. But he also said, with malice towards none and charity to all. You can be firm in your positions, but you don't have to exhibit malice toward those who have different positions. That's a difficult tightrope to walk, to be firm in your position, but nevertheless be a listener, be a little bit humble about your own position, and don't exhibit malice to somebody on the other side. But that's what we have to do. And I think a lot of us in elected life have, have fallen down on that. Um, we, we also, all of us, in, our, in political work but in the broader world, you've got to spend time with people who don't agree with you um, and, and engage. We self-sort. We self-sort so much by what media we watch. There's even a self-sorting in where people live now that was really unheard of in earlier generations. Most states were more narrowly divided between Dems and ours, and there weren't landslides one way or the other. But we're really self-sorting in politics in a way that I think can be dangerous, and it enables all of us to just get more reinforced in our views. Maybe our views are right, maybe they're not. But not to be open to understanding other people's perspectives. So, the ability to be a good listener without it making you kind of namby-pamby about your, your own positions, that's a delicate line to walk. To, to walk. But be firm in the right, uh, but be willing to listen, and you can be firm in the right without being malicious toward others. Let me ask you a policy question, if mm -hmm. I may. As a member of the Center Foreign Relations Committee, what do you feel the biggest foreign policy challenges facing this nation are? And what concerns you about an approach to foreign policy that puts America first? Uh, and why is America's global leadership important to, to both this country and the world? Yeah, those are huge questions. And Alan has spent a lot of time on these questions in the role of, that he played as ambassador to Spain and before. Um, you know, I think the, the most important foreign policy for the, issue for the United States is to, is to have a strategy for how we look at the world. Um, the U.S. had a, and I'm, I've been thinking a lot about this recently, because I had a military officer who appeared before the Armed Services Committee say, we have O plans, but no strategy. We have operational plans for every contingency, but we don't have a strategy that ties any of them together. The U.S. had a, had a national security strategy that, that was called the Truman Doctrine that really was 1946, 1947 until 1989. And Lots been written about the pluses and minuses of the Truman Doctrine. It was basically to contain Soviet expansion. Um, and there were pluses and minuses to it. But there was a doctrine. And it wasn't just a military doctrine. The Peace Corps, the Race to the Moon, Fulbright scholarships, a lot of things came out of a, a global strategy that was bipartisan, that was hatched by a Democratic president, a Republican Congress, that lasted through administrations of both parties. Since the Soviet Union collapsed, we haven't had a working strategy. We've been pragmatic case-by-case case people in the end of the first Bush administration and the Clinton administration. After the attack of 9-11, we came up with a partial strategy, the war on terror, global war on terror. Terrorism is an issue. It's still an issue. But that wasn't a big enough idea to uh, encompass our humanitarian or our trade or, or our strength of our moral example. It, it, was, it was a very militaristic look at the world, which is, part, which is necessary but not sufficient. The, the, the realization that Congress and decision makers went into the Iraq war based on false intelligence kind of discredited the global war on terror as the American strategy. And during much of the Obama administration, and I'm very close to the president, but we were back in a case-by-case -case mode. I think we need a national security strategy that really conceives of how we are in the world. The way I tend to think of it on these two committees is unlike the U.S. versus the Soviet Union, the Truman Doctrine, we're kind of in a tripolar world where there are democracies, authoritarians, and non-states. 
And democracies are in different parts of the world and they're different and so are authoritarians. And you, we kind of have to, let's take on the role not of being the world's sole superpower, that was the Truman Doctrine. Not the, the indispensable nation, that was Madeleine Albright, President Clinton's formulation. Let's try to be the exemplary democracy in the democratic role model and do things that make us exemplary. That, we, there's some things that aren't exemplary about us right now. This presidential election, whatever you think of the outcome, 51% of eligible people voted. High stakes presidential election. It's about 66, 67% of registers, but only 51% of the American public in a high stakes election even bothered to vote for who their next president would be. In a governor's race in Massachusetts or an off-year Senate race in Virginia, that number will be 35%. We're gonna have to come up with a new term because I don't think democracy is a phrase that applies to a nation where there's essentially a near universal franchise, but a lot of people make the choice not to participate. And then there's obstacles put in people's way too. I'm not, I'm not saying it's all on the voters' shoulders, but everybody's gotta own some of this. And so we have a lot to, to, to fix internally, but I think the role we should play in the world is to try to be the exemplary democracy in that, in that co collection of democracies, and not by force, but by example, uh, trying to convince leaders and citizens and authoritarian nations like, wow, that's a better model. And often the non-state threat is the thing that can uh, find areas of consensus even between democracies and authoritarians. So non-state actors, cyber, all big issues, but we won't be our best in dealing with these issues unless we try to work on some consensus for the role that we want to play in the world, and we really haven't had one since the late 1980s. Before I call on some students to ask questions, I, you, we, didn't ha we don't have a band here for you. I wondered if you <laughs> brought your harmonica. They're in my briefcase in the car, yes. Mm -hmm. So tell us about music in your life. Um, so I, I, we did not have music lessons, you know, when I was a kid, and I kind of envied friends who had taken music lessons. And so I decided when I was in middle school, well, what can I teach myself easily? And I decided the harmonica, because you can suck and that's okay. In fact, that's how you make half the notes. <laughs> Literally. Um, Literally. Yeah, actually, you make half the notes that way. So I, I taught myself to play the harmonica, and I played it for about 50 or 45 years now. And Virginia is a state, and we've got some Virginians in the audience. It's a state filled with great musicians from the Dave Matthews Band to Missy Misdemeanor Elliott, and I mean, we got, and Pharrell, I mean, we got some, we got some great, great, Seal is, uh, um, um, no, not Seal, who I'm, who I'm blanking on. Anyway, great musicians, great musicians. Um, D'Angelo is from Chesterfield County. We got great musicians. Um, but there's music festivals all over the state, so I play a lot of music with, uh, with bands, and it's, it's kind of helped me a little bit in life and in politics, not only because they're amazed you can do anything other than you know, give a speech. Um, <laughs> although my wife says when you're invited to play, play, because as soon as you're not in office, nobody's inviting you to play. That's what. <laughs> um, but music is about listening. It's a lost art, not just in politics. It's a lost art in society. Music is about collaboration. If you're playing with a group, you know, you're listening and deciding where to blend in. Music is about innovation, in, you know, uh, improvisation and being an innovator. But the thing I like, and I bet, I bet overwhelming numbers of people in this room are artists in some way. So it might not be music, it might be visual art or theater or something. There's a real connection between art and politics and, and religion, actually. It, if, you, if we didn't, as humans, instinctively understand that there is a gulf between what is and what could be, religion wouldn't exist. And I'm not sure art would exist, and I'm not sure politics would exist. Politics and religion and art all have a fundamental thing about humans understand there's a gulf between what is and what can be. And we're trying to grapple with both describing that gulf and then tackling. There's a beautiful song by the Carter family who are Virginia, who invented like country music in Bristol in the 1920s that really exemplifies this song's called No Depression. I'm going where there's no depression to a better land that's free from care. I'll leave this world of toil and trouble. My home's in heaven, I'm waiting there. It's a song, it's a, it's a, it's a piece of work. It's a, about music. It's about religion. It's about the depression. It was written in the 1930s. It's about a political reality and trying to grapple with there is a greater thing 
that we can get to out of the hard times we're living in. And I, I really feel like when I'm, I, when I'm in the midst of music, especially kind of old timey tunes that are in that mode, I, I'm, I'm grappling with what I grapple with in politics, which is defining the distance between what is and what can be, and then trying to figure out how to build a bridge over that canyon. We have a couple of gifts, I'll give them to you at, at the end, but one of them is a, a CD that we cut spe especially for you wow. by the Tufts Jazz Orchestra. I like it. So let me just, that's one oh, of that's, your gifts today. Thank you, Alan, thank you. <clears throat> so we have a group of students who are here in the second row who are gonna ask some questions that they formulated. Say your name and your class and what you're studying. Hello, Senator Kane. Thank you so much for coming today. My name is Eva Khan. I'm a sophomore studying international relations. You cited your Jesuit service in Honduras as inspiring your dedication to global citizenship and engagement. At the same time, religiosity today has been used to excuse or justify acts of hatred across the world and across faiths. My question is, how can a person of faith connect with fellow believers under a platform of love and acceptance mm -hmm. while understanding that said faith could be distorted or weaponized against one's values? Great question. Very good Thank question. You. Um, first, I think humans would be murderous and evil if there was no religion. I, I, you're right that evil gets justified by religion, but if we didn't have religion, we would do it for some other reason. You know, I don't like your hair color or something. I think. We're, we're flawed people. Um, and that's, that part of human nature is not dramatically going to change. We can always be better, but I don't think we're going to perfect humankind in a way that, that evil, prejudice, discrimination, division is, you know, we become free of it as a species. What, what I like to do in um, kind of thinking about religion in public life is I think there's some polar positions that are somewhat strong, man, but I'll just set them up anyway. One is, I'm a religious person, so my job should be in public life to mandate the dictates of my faith for everybody. That's one polar position. And then there's another position that says, I'm a religious person, but there's separation of church and state, so I shouldn't talk about that in the, in the public space. And I will say, that is a very doctrinally justified position. If you read the New Testament, there's so many, and the Old Testament too, there's a lot about not praying loudly in front of the temple. If you're fasting, don't tell everybody you're fasting. You're not supposed to do it for show. You're supposed to do it for your own internal enlightenment. So these are polar positions, either mandated on everybody or don't get into it at all in the public life. What I've tried to do is share with people what motivates me. Not to proselytize them, not to tell them they should be like me, but to give them a basis for understanding the way I approach things. And and I encourage others to do that too. In fact, a little bit on the Democratic side, I, I actually think Democrats are sort of weaker at this than Republicans are generally. That we are, we're like really wonky policy people. So we will list 10 policies that are important, but eventually it kind of sounds like a, a grocery list, even if they're all important. But the, what's, where's the, you know, the, the blood and flesh that's putting them all together? It's just not a list. It's about people. It's about something more than that. So if you share what motivates you, then I think you create a ground for connecting with somebody, even if it's something, you know, something different motivates them. I have colleagues who are motivated by their religious faith. I have colleagues who are motivated by, here's what happened to me when I was a kid. I don't want anybody to have to suffer through that like I did. And I think if you, if you share motivation rather than, you know, here's my doctrine and I want you to embrace it, that motivation can become a connection point. I, in fact, I've never seen an honest sharing of motivation be a div point of division. I, I think it's a point of understanding. And, and I've often felt, you know, my, uh, my legal counsel when I was governor was a really good friend of mine who lives on the block who's Jewish and has got a son who's a rabbi. And I would say, my knowing Mark has made me a much better Catholic. And I hope him knowing me has made him a better Jew. And I think that we can do that for each other. But if we weren't willing to share what really motivates us, we wouldn't have been able to kind of enlighten each other and help, help each other up our game. Thank you. Mm -hmm. William. Hi, Senator Kane. I'm William Stockton, a uh, senior chemical engineer at Tufts. Hey, William. Um, President, o President Obama tells us to hold on to our hope in America and our belief in America uh, while striving for change. But it's not just change, uh, it's change, with, change through organization uh, and perspective and having the ability to step in someone else's shoes. What should we be doing as tough students to strive for change and get outside the bubble of a private liberal institution? Yeah. 
Well, first, you know, Tisch and the university generally give you some opportunities that not every university gives to students. And so the commitment of Tufts to civic engagement is really important. Um, second, as disappointing as this you know, election is, and it's bitterly disappointing. I mean, I, I was a civil rights lawyer for 17 years. I'm worried about civil rights rollback. I spent a formative year working with Latinos. I'm worried about people being deported. You know, I, I'm, the, the, the things I work, I've worked for my whole life are things that I think are kind of at risk, but I'm not losing hope because I've seen my society change so much in the 58 years that I've been on the planet and change for the good. And I also know something about history. So our history is um, we make advances and then often advances, especially in the equality front, are met with a little bit of a backlash. So the, the age of Obama has been African-American president, protections for dreamers, first Latina on the Supreme Court, LGBT marriage equality, women can serve in any MOS in the military, and then we nominated a woman for president. That was in eight years. We made a huge jump forward, and there was a, there was a backlash against it, just like there was after the Constitution was amended at the close of the Civil War, then there was a backlash. Did the Civil Rights Acts in the 1960s, then was a, there was a backlash. The backlash never goes all the way back. It goes part of the way back, and then we have to start pushing again. And that was what was so exciting about these these rallies this week. And so the main way I want to answer your question is just in their first phrase, President Obama is right. We're disappointed. Things don't go our way all the time, those of, those of us who are disappointed. But, but we, can just, we can just keep pushing because we're going to make things better. And the look, the activity over the weekend, that march in Washington, you don't see that in non-democratic nations to the degree, and especially you don't see that with nobody arrested. Not one person was arrested in DC during the march on Saturday. Um, that is a tribute to the strength of our democracy and the strength of people's ability to participate. So what, what I would say to you is kind of back to an answer I gave to Alan, pick an, what is the issue you care most about? That's hard, because I mean, I bet a lot of people here, you can think of five things and they're all crowding into number one. But what is the one you care most about? And put yourself into that space in a grassroots way. And then you're going to find a connection between that and political engagement too. But I'd start with the issue and the grassroots advocacy and put yourself out on the limb for the issue that you care the most about. Alexa? Hi, my name is Alexa Weinstein. Alexa. I'm a freshman at Tufts. I'm double majoring in political science and education. So how do you think compromising will work under the Trump administration? Being that Democrats are the Senate minority, there are only so many things they can filibuster and refuse to compromise on until they are viewed as obstructionists, yep. just as Republicans were for so long. So ultimately, how do you decide between your moral values and actually getting things done for Americans? Yeah, that, that is a real good question. And I'll tell you that this, this is a big debate that's going on within the Democratic Senate Caucus of 48, but the Democratic Party generally. Here's a thesis, which I don't accept, but I got to admit, the, the, the thesis has some evidence behind it. They would say, well, look, when President Obama came president, folks said, we're going to oppose him on everything. And they did, and it worked. He did get reelected in 2012, but the midterms in 2010 weren't good. The midterms in 2014 weren't good. We couldn't elect a successor to the president in 2016. So I have colleagues who say, see, it worked. We should do the same thing. My reaction is, well, yeah, it worked. If, if all you're measuring it by is elections, it worked. But did it work for people? I mean, did it work for the good of the country? I don't think it did. I don't, I don't think it worked. But, but I do, there are colleagues of mine who really believe we should, there was a successful strategy and we should adopt the same thing. I disagree for, for at least three reasons. One, I didn't get elected for, for the party politics thing. I got elected to do stuff and my voters want me to do stuff. Second, if you critique everything, then you really muddy the value of your critique. Like, I'm going to fight to the death to make sure that 30 million people don't lose health insurance because it's about, it's, it is life and death. But if I'm fighting about everything, well, it's, it's harder to make the case that this is like a really principled big deal argument. Am I just fighting because I want to be an oppositionist? So I think you, you increase the value of your critique by not fighting everything. I'm going to vote, I've already declared, I'm going to vote no on some of the cabinet secretaries, but I'm voting yes on others. If I vote a no on all of them, that's not really a critique. But if I, no, I think these are fine, but let me tell you about these ones I'm going to vote. Now then I've got to, I think I make my critique more powerful. The other thing that's a very practical issue 
is in the Senate, you can't legislate without 60 votes, but that's a Senate rule that can be changed. The majority can change it. If we obstruct on everything, they could well say, well, boy, we're getting tired of this. So let's just change the rule. Now it's 51 votes on everything. And then we will be able to give really pure speeches, but we'll lose on the matters that really matter to folks. So the, the, the British playwright Joe Wharton has this wonderful phrase, Lord, give me the ability to rage correctly. <laughs> you can have a lot of energy about resisting and fighting, and it's important that we do. A judicious sense of outrage is one of the important things that you have to have in life. But you've got to do it in a way where there's some precision to it, to, in my view, to increase the power of your critique, to continue to get things done, and then not end up handing away the emergency break that we have. Hi, my name is Alexander Jezik, and I'm a second year Master's of Arts in Law and Diplomacy student at the Fletcher School, studying international trade. And my question is, what is your advice for graduating students who are passionate about a career in public yeah. service or government, um, considering the possibility of a federal hiring freeze? Yeah, no, I, very good question. So, I hope many of you are really interested in public service, and of course that can be broadly defined, you know, from being a PTA president to heading up an, you know, the board of a charitable organization, but I do hope a lot of you are interested in public service and even running for office. I mean, here's, here's a challenge. Running for office is getting very, very tough, expensive, you don't have any privacy if you do something stupid, and you will do something stupid. Um, it will be on full view for everybody. Your friends will see you do something stupid and say, yeah, but I really like her. In politics, when you do something stupid, they don't want to give you the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> and so there's a lot of reasons not to go into political office, but I will say, having been in it for 22 years, even if the pluses and minuses that are tangible on the T-chart don't seem to add up, the intangibles really add up. So I drive around Richmond, and I know there will be a day when I won't be in politics, and then a week later people will have like forgotten I'm in politics and say, didn't you used to do the weather on TV or something? <laughs> but, but while other people will forget, I don't forget. So I go by every corner in my city and I see something that wouldn't be there if it weren't for me. And I'll never forget that. Whether anybody else remembers it, I'll never forget it. So I would encourage you to think about it. Here would be my advice to those of you who are thinking about public service careers. Develop an expertise and bring it into government and politics rather than have your, having your expertise be government and politics. Um, I never thought I'd be in politics, so I was a civil rights lawyer for 17 years practicing before I got you know, into state politics. I had an expertise. You know, I was deeply engaged in nonprofits in the areas of homelessness, and I understood the civil rights laws, especially fair housing and employment and voting rights. I had an expertise. And then I got into politics and I brought something with me. There are some exceptions to this, but in general, the people that I've worked with who I think are the most effective are people who had a really significant expertise in something. It might be research, it might be I was a law enforcement officer, I was a veteran, I ran a business, I was an elementary school teacher, I was a civil rights lawyer, I was a doctor. I had worked with a great legislator who was a tree surgeon. I worked with large animal veterinarians who came into public life. But if you develop an expertise and bring it in, then people are going to, oh wow, she's the one who knows this. Then they start to defer to you and then they kind of want to come to you to get advice. Compared to somebody whose expertise is, I, you know, I just worked on campaigns and I was a government person that's a narrower expertise. So I would say there's going to be so many opportunities for you over the course of your life to do public service. I would think about what is my substantive expertise passion that if I get to be really good at it, that I can then bring as a value add into, into public life. So that would, be, that would be my advice. Last question. Hi, Senator Kane. Uh, my name is Anjali Rao, and I'm a sophomore studying community health. Uh, my question is, given the fact that Republicans now control Congress, the White House, and many state legislatures across the country, what do you think the goals of the Democratic Party should be moving forward? Um, now, that's a big question. So do, what, do we have an hour here? I mean, um, we, th there are a couple of things, just a couple of narrow things, but then big, the big picture, right? The, the Dems in this country are remarkably unified on social issues, remarkably so. Um, who would have thought that across a Democratic caucus that is very broad in the Senate, support for marriage equality, 100%. That, that would not be what I would have expected 10 years ago, but that is the case. And on other social issues, we are in near 
we are in unity and to some degree near unanimity on social issues. But the Dems are grappling with a debate about what is our economic posture going forward. You know, it, there's sort of a pro-growth wing and a pro-regulation redistribution wing. I'm slightly overstating it, but there's, you know, there's sort of a com competing economic message which then leads to a muddy economic message because if you're trying to, we got to hammer out how there can be growth in our economy with a growth that is meaningfully shared. And people, people have to see a ladder that they can climb. They can decide whether to climb it, but too many people in the country, they don't see the ladder they can climb. And so that is something that we have to do. Um, but, but, you know, big picture for the Dems, as I think about the Democratic Party, my parents were Republicans, because uh, I grew up in Kansas and virtually everybody was, I and mean, it was just kind of what you were. And I sometimes will tell people that I'm a Democrat because I realized my parents are Republicans and I became a Democrat. So, <laughs> but I, I really think I'm a Democrat because Democrats are, we're underdog people. You know, it's funny, we're now a minority party, but we're kind of naturally when we're in complete majority, like have both houses and have the White House, that's kind of an odd position for Democrats to be in because the thing that kind of unifies us is that we're, we're sort of underdog people. I, I was often on the trail just drawing on my own faith tradition telling the Good Samaritan story. There's somebody at the side of the road beating up and asking for help. And a whole lot of people are just walking right on by and not helping. And this is not a story about 2,000 years ago. This is a story about today and tomorrow. A lot of people walk on by and don't help people with titles, people with positions, people who should know better, people more leaders, walking on by and not helping. In the story, the Samaritan is a despised minority in that story. And he has some place to go too. I mean, he's traveling and he's got something to do. But he's like, well, I'm not gonna just walk on by. Somebody needs my help. And, and, and I think that that expresses something about who we are as a people. And I, I also think at our best, it expresses something about who we are as a party. We may not have all the answers. You don't even need to have any of the answers. All you need is the instinct to say, I'm not gonna walk on by. I'm gonna go over and help, and then once I go over, then I can kind of figure out what to do. And I think just kind of reclaiming that we're underdog people, and Americans like underdogs, and we like underdog stories, and we have a sympathy for underdogs, and that's, that's kind of who we are, and, and I kind of put virtually everything we do into a frame like that. So, we're gonna to have to battle over some economic policy issues and the, the role of America in the world. Other Democrats might have described it differently than me. But at, but at bottom, you know, blue dog, super progressive, whatever, we're kind of underdog people and we really just need to, you know, reclaim that mantle and be true to it. Senator, thank you. Hey, this thanks. has been this a great so treat. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.